I'm Chris Evans, Extension Forester with the University of Illinois, and we're looking here at emerald ash borer. If you're not familiar with emerald ash borer, it is an invasive insect that has moved into Illinois. Uh, here in southern Illinois, it's been about five years, and it attacks our ash trees. So we have four different species of ash tree down here, and the problem is our native ash really have no resistance to this insect. And so what we're seeing is a lot of mortality, a lot of the ash are just dying from this insect feeding on them. Um, it's a hazard for us because um, that as the ash die, they become a risk for falling down. We're also losing the species out of our ecosystems. So I'm beside an ash tree here that has died from emerald ash borer. So it shows kind of some of the symptoms that you see commonly with emerald ash borer. And then up, up here close, where the bark has fallen off, you can actually see the little galleries. So that's where the little larvae of the ash borer have been feeding. And so they get just under the, the bark, and they make these kind of snaking, uh, uh, sinuous galleries, and they eat that inner bark layer, that cambial layer. And over time, this basically just girdles the whole tree, starves it of nutrients, uh, and eventually kills it. And this is really visible here. You can see there's multiple other places where this is happening. As the tree dies, um, the bark separates from the inner part of the tree and you get this really loose bark that peels back like this. And so just peeling it back, you can see more of those galleries. Um, and so that's another sign for emerald ash borer is loose peeling bark um, like this, especially when they're in the advanced stage. In the smaller branches where the bark is thinner, and that's usually higher in the tree, um, you'll see exit holes. So as the, the larvae, when they finish um, feeding, they get large enough, they'll pupate under the bark and turn into an adult. And then the adult chews its way out uh, of the tree. And they do that, they make a little, little tiny, we call an exit hole, that's a clean D shape. So it's flat on one side and rounded on the other. And the reason why is the, the, the adults themselves have a flat head too, so it kind of mimics the shape of their head, but it's really, really noticeable on those smaller branches. It's a really clean kind of capital D shaped exit hole. And that's usually the, one of the first signs you see for a emerald ash borer, even before you see a lot of this advanced stage problems. Another sign for emerald ash borer is heavy woodpecker feeding. Woodpeckers will key in on uh, the fact that there's a lot of these larvae under the bark and they'll start focusing on ash trees. So if you see a lot of this um, bark being sloughed off like this, it's called blonding or flecking. That's a good sign. And then all of these ragged holes here, that's actually woodpecker feeding holes where they burrowed through the bark to eat the emerald ash borer larvae. And trees that are kind of in that advanced stage of infestation, they're at the close to the point of dying. This is a very common, you'll see this through them. And, that, and that's one of the things we key in on when we look for uh, emerald ash borer is this flecking and all these little woodpecker holes. So this is another sign of emerald ash borer that you'll commonly see. And it's usually one of the first ones um, to kind of clue in on that your tree's in trouble. And it's this, we call it epicormal sprouting. It's all these small diameter um, little branches that come out of the bigger branches. It's basically the tree is, as the ash borer is chewing through the tree and kind of depriving it of nutrients, um, it's the tree's effort to try to get more nutrients out there, get more photosynthetic capacity. So it's putting up a whole lot more branches just trying to get the, what it needs to, to survive, get more energy. And um, it, usually this is kind of, once we see this, within a year or two, this tree's gonna drop. Um, drop down and probably die in a few years. There's not a lot you can do on a large scale to get rid of emerald ash borer. Um, if you have a lot of ash in your forest, that's pretty much going to go through there and you're going to expect to lose it. But if you do have, you know, an ash tree in your yard um, or someone that's, or a tree that's really special to you or something that's a, a centerpiece of your landscaping or whatever, the way that, a tree that you want to keep there are some things you can do to keep emerald ash borer out of those trees, as long as you do it early enough before the trees really starting to be impacted, and it's pesticides. So you can put um, either a soil drench or an injection, and you put this systemic pesticide in there that will kill the ash borers. The problem is it only lasts for one to three years, depending on the chemicals you use, so you have to repeat it, but it's very effective at keeping emerald ash borer out of your ash trees 
and keeping your ash trees healthy as long as um, it's not too advanced already. If it's, it's in a bad state, you're already seeing a lot of decline or dieback, then you're probably too late. But catch it early and you can save a tree uh, from emerald ash borer. But again, it's a repeated treatment kind of thing. We are starting to kind of research ash now here down at the Ag Center and throughout Southern Illinois. And we're trying to get a better sense of how fast these trees start to break down and how fast they become a hazard. Um, so we're, we're looking at, uh, we've, we're trapping emerald ash borer, surveying for it throughout the southern 11 counties, and we're monitoring trees over five years to kind of see their rate of decline and how quick they become hazardous. Um, and the idea would be that we, we know um, when we have to implement management strategies, how long we have to afterwards, just some better ideas for managers to know kind of how to respond to emerald ash borer. So the, the one good thing about emerald ash borer is it really is restricted just to ash trees. So um, other species, you know, it's not gonna move over to maples or to oaks or anything like that. Um, ash is an important part of our ecosystems. We have an estimated close to 150 million ash trees in Illinois. So uh, it, it is gonna be a big impact, but luckily it's really restricted just to those trees. We don't see it moving in Illinois to any other species. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions. We have a great guest with us today, which we'll get to, and we are going to be focusing on vegetable gardening today, but we can touch on any of your gardening questions, so feel free to start adding those into the chat box if you have them. My name is Candice. I'm your State Master Gardener Specialist here for Illinois Extension, based here in central Illinois. And I love to chat all about flowers. So today's topic is not my expertise area, but luckily we have a couple of other great horticulturists on who are vegetable gardeners and have a lot to talk about today. So Ryan, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Candice. My name is Ryan Pancaw. I'm the horticulture educator out of Champaign County. And vegetables aren't my first bit of expertise, but I'm definitely a hobby vegetable gardener. I've you know just grown the backyard vegetable patch for years and just really enjoy doing that to grow food for my family. My my areas of expertise though are um, trees and shrubs and kind of native plants are, are where I've done, you know, most of my work professionally and just kind of what I like to to, to learn more about and talk about. But um, we have another great guest today. So Jennifer, would you mind uh, introducing yourself, please? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Fishburn. I'm a horticulture educator in um, central Illinois. So Logan Menard and Sagamon counties. We also oversee our Master Gardener Master Naturals programs. Um, I enjoy talking about vegetables, herbs, and I'm getting into natives now uh, around my house and pollinator type plants. Um, but as a horticulture educator, we can talk just about anything. So um, yeah. looking forward to that. And I would say uh, my vegetable gardening probably goes back to the day I could walk. Um, my mom was an avid vegetable gardener, so I've been doing it my whole life. Doesn't make me an expert necessarily, but I'm pretty comfortable with most of it. Got some experience, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. cool. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. Okay, well, hit us with those questions, guys. Feel free to start adding those into the comment box. Um, Kathy's already commented that her tomato plants are not doing so well, so we're definitely going to get to that Today, and if you've got specifics, Kathy, definitely let us know and we'll try to try to help. But while we wait for kind of questions to come in, 
think we're just going to kind of talk about what's going on in your guys's vegetable gardens right now, in particular, um, Jennifer's. And I think you've got some pictures of kind of how your garden's looking. So you want to start there, Jennifer? Sure, we can start there. That's good. So have we started? No. You guys, there we go. There we go. (laughs) So um, last night I went out to my garden and I did one of those things where I tell people, um, don't do this. I I waited two days to pick things. So I didn't bring the overgrown stuff. But while I was out there, I took a a handful of pictures that I thought I'd share with you guys today. This one here is of a bush early girl two tomato plants. It's two tomato, but there's two tomato plants in this particular container. This is in an earth box. Um, And this one is in a grow bag that you can see. And this is the same plant, um, just planted a little bit earlier. So it's a little bit bigger, a little bit more mature. And I've already gotten four ripe tomatoes off of this. And they look about like this, about the size of a baseball. Um, So far, Perfect tomatoes, no blemishes, shouldn't talk too loud yet, but they're looking pretty good. Um, says it'll produce hundreds of, to- of at least 100 tomatoes, so we'll see. Um, it's just started, but I'm excited about this plant. As you can see, this is growing in a container without any support, um, and it's doing very well. It, get, it grows about 18 to 24 inches. Um the only unfortunate thing for most gardeners is that you would have to order the seeds and plant your start your own plants um, as opposed to buying those in a garden center. I've not seen them available. Doesn't mean they're not, but um, so far this is performing really nicely. So it stays shorter? So it you does. Have, you actually it, won't have to stake or do anything then. It says it's self-supporting. Now, this particular one that you're looking at, it does, you can see it's um, up against our deck with the Uh, railing behind it. So that's supporting it just a little bit. Um, But the other ones that you previous ones you saw in the pictures have no support. And this this one's just leaning a little bit. And I guess the other question I'd have is, is it determinate or indeterminate? It's determinate. So it will only grow up to about two feet tall. It matures in about 54 days, Um, has really good disease resistance. You can see in this picture, Mm -hmm. there's a leaf hanging over the container. I did pick that one off. Uh, it was looking a little yellowish, so I got that out of there pretty quickly. Hopefully, it'll prevent any further spread of what was going on there. Um, could have been just lack of watering as well. Who knows? Um, but <laughs> with the container gardens, as you know, you need to water every day, if not twice a day. Yeah. Um, and this is growing just in a good quality grow mix that I purchased um, at the garden center. So uh, we'll see. Uh, I'm excited for it right now, though. It's looking really nice. Yeah, looking great. That's a great one for a container, for sure. And uh, even though these are on my deck, um, I went out one day a week or two ago <laughs> and noticed one of the leaves completely stripped down and found this this uh, lovely tobacco hornworm on my plant, uh, which was promptly removed after the photo was taken. <laughs> um but I did get rid of this one. If you do see these and they've got the egg cases on the outside of those, leave those alone. Those are parasitized. Um, leave, leave those be. But this one didn't have anything. So he was he or she was removed from my garden. Well, so before the show, Jennifer, you mentioned some interesting an interesting fact about tobacco versus tomato hornworm. I didn't know this. But this is a tobacco it. hornworm. And the identification on that is the red horn that you see in the picture. A tomato hornworm has a black or a dark blue um, horn. So that would be the difference. Um, either way, they both eat your tomatoes. Yeah. And either way, get rid can of them. Eggplants right right. and can eat potatoes as well. Um, so you probably want to yeah. remove those as they get a little bit larger. If you want, you can find them another host plant, but otherwise you can just toss them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're and they're not anything that you need to spray for, or you, you know, they hand picking. Totally yeah, if you normal. if you've got a, a a what I would call a normal vegetable to make home garden, um, obviously hand picking these is going to be the easiest way to get rid of them. Um, being just vigilant and being out there every day and paying attention uh, is the easiest way to remove them. And they, I mean, they definitely blend in well, but obviously 
if you see your your stems are stripped bare of of leaves, you you start to do a little searching, right? Yeah, um, and on this one, um, you can't see it in this picture, but I have another picture. Um, his excrement was laying on top of the plastic um, covering the earth box, so that also was pretty evident that there was a visitor that I did not want in my garden. So yeah, good eye. <laughs> well, and another thing I've noticed is they're real active at night. It's like at night they're up at the very tips of the plants at the top, where during the daytime they tend to be a little mm -hmm. more hidden or concealed. So that's kind of like after my kids go to bed and I do a walk around, like I'll cruise through the garden and like check for these these guys if I see some damage. So that's yeah. a good time to check. Yeah. Nice. You can and, also find their eggs on the leaves, but that's generally you're not thinking about that. You're you generally see these once they've done some damage to the plants. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, give us that tomato variety again that you were just talking about. This is about. Bush Early Girl 2. Bush early girl too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and like I said, I've been pretty impressed with it so far, um, nice. especially for a container-grown plant. Because we, you know, we talk to people a lot about finding those spaces and growing in containers, and tomatoes are one of those things that you have to find the right plant for it to do well in a container. And mm -hmm. and this one obviously is doing performing very well. Nice. Um, so on the flip side of being positive about my tomato plants, um, this is what happens when you don't monitor um, and do a good IPM practice of removing squash bugs from your garden. Um, this is only about three weeks into the squash bugs starting in my garden, and I will lose these plants. Um, mm. They're they're pretty well gone. Um but they produced really well while the three weeks. So uh, one of the things I'll be doing is doing some replanting uh, tonight, actually, of my squash plants. Um, I could try to treat at this point, but the problem is, is the mature squash bugs, there's very really no chemicals that will take care of those. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just vigilance and squashing those egg cases and squashing the bugs and um, following up with some insecticide. Um, this is one of the plants that if you don't usually treat for squash bugs, you will lose them to squash bugs. I don't know what others' experiences have been, but that's my experience. Well, same thing. Same thing for me. Um, you know, it is great. It is pretty easy to find the eggs, though. I'm, yeah. I'm always surprised at how mm -hmm. they stick out. And especially when you get kind of tuned in to look for them, that's a great way to, to get them out of there. But, yeah. But they're pro yeah. once they get going, they're pretty prolific. So you can spend hours out there picking off egg cases, um, particularly at this time. Yeah, it's got to be early. Eight. Yeah, it's got to be early. Yeah. yeah. And we actually had a question over on YouTube asking about that earlier. Um, Mimi's in the South Chicago area. Do squash beetles come in two waves? Or do you think it's pretty consistent? The whole season. I don't know. So once squash bugs usually come into a garden space, obviously they're laying eggs and those nymphs grow into adults. Um, so you're going to have them the rest of the season um, unless you control them immediately. Yeah, it just seems continuous. Like once they show up, they're just there. But yeah. now squash vine borers, they'll typically lay their um, well, they'll inject or put their eggs and then the boar will bore up through the stem earlier on in the season. So we usually tell people if it's squash vine bore is your problem, plant your squash seeds around mid-June and then you should be able to avoid that time frame in which the squash boars are laying their eggs. Yeah. Um, so that one's a little bit, that one's different than the squash bugs. Uh, any tips on, Kathy asks, any, how can we prevent squash bugs? Do egg shells help? Any prevention tips that people can do? The only way I was able to somewhat get a handle on them um, has been if I plant my squash in containers now on my deck, the squash bugs tend not to find them. But squash bugs, the adults will overwinter in plant debris. So any plant debris you leave in your vegetable garden or nearby your garden, they'll overwinter in there. And then you just keep the problem going every single year. So if you have a large garden space, odds are once you get squash bugs, you really can't get rid of them. Um, but I've found that if I plant in containers later in the season, 
I tend to not have any issues. Just, yeah, to really clean up the season before. And then, like you said earlier, just stay diligent on inspecting yeah. your plants, keep an eye on things. Nice. That that seems to always that's that's my one insect that I can count on every single year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then I yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, I just wanted to show next. Um, so last night I picked uh, felt like a five gallon bucket of cucumbers because I didn't hadn't been out since Sunday. Um, this one here is my favorite uh, cucumber. This is Diva. It has a really thin uh, skin. Um, don't they don't typically get bitter, um, mm -hmm. so they're just really easy to clean and you know rinse them off and cut them up and eat them. Um, but I show showing this picture here. Uh, this is the first year I've tried this. These are cattle panels. We used uh, two of them in our garden this year, and we're training our cucumbers to grow up it. Nice. And so far, I don't know if it's just a, a luck or if it's if this is helping, um, but the cucumber plants look better than they have ever looked. Um, very healthy, and they're taking up a whole lot less space in my garden. You can tell that they're pretty crowded in here um, and tends to be a little bit easier to pick. And then I say that, and if you look closely mm -hmm. into this picture, you can see one of my cucumbers that got a little bit bigger than it probably should have. Um, I don't know why that one, I didn't even see it till I took this picture. Um, I'd already gone through the garden, but anyway, they're there. You just sometimes don't see them, but it's made picking a little bit, I think, easier uh, growing them on a trellis. And all you have to really do is take the vine as it's growing out and kind of feed it up through one of those holes and it'll it'll do the rest. And I, I've been very pleased with trellising them this year. So highly recommend that if, if you're able to do that. This was two cattle pails and about four steak tea, tea post um, put into the ground. So we'll see how it does. Yeah, I use a really similar setup just because years ago I got some free cattle panels from somebody and always have tea posts. But um, if if you anybody listening doesn't know what a cattle panel is, I mean, you, you can get them at Rural King or any place. It's a standard if if you're raising cattle, it's a standard part of probably your fencing or corral area. So, but they are just heavy duty. They'll last forever. They'll last a lifetime, yes. probably. So you know, once I got my initial set of these, I've never had to buy another one. <laughs> so it's it's worth the investment. And another thing that we've done a couple times, and I, I should have taken some pictures this morning. I just ran out of time, but. Uh, We've bent them in an arch also, mm -hmm. and they're they're rigid enough where you can, if you can affix them to T-posts at all four corners that are touching the ground, it'll just stay up in an arch like that. So we've got vining stuff going up that. We actually did um, loofahs this this mm -hmm. year, you know, growing up that. And so that's the first time we've ever grown, you know, the loofah squash, and uh, that's what I call it. There's probably a better, more technical name for it, but um just looks neat. It's fun to walk out there and walk under the trellis thing. And like Jennifer said, gets it out of your way. I, you, you know, you're not wasting all that space down low. It's It gets it up. And I'm almost getting worried that I need to start clipping back some of that vine because it's getting so massive up there. Um, we just may have way more than we even need of it. But, um, but anyway, yeah, cattle panels are great. Or, or hog panels are a little shorter. Mm -hmm. It's similar, like really heavy duty metal just would last, you know, for a hundred years sitting out there. So great, yeah. great products. For us in, in having this traditional garden, this, um, these were actually used for in a goat pen um, and we mm -hmm. weren't using them. So they got mm -hmm. moved over to the garden this year just to see how it would do. Plus, I don't know what was ha I was thinking, but I planted things a little bit too close. So had to, had to fix that problem. <laughs> um, but you can see in this picture, obviously that, I have multiple types of cucumbers in here and how they're growing each a little bit different. And one of them is very robust and going all over the place. And the other one, not so much. Um, well, I think I'd recommend if you're doing this is not to put picklers next to your slicing cucumbers so that you don't get confused on what mm -hmm. size you're supposed to be picking things at. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, it's working really well this year. You know, you talk about uh, planting too close. Like I'm a chronic offender of that. You know, I, my wife always complains like, how are you going to get down that row or get, get in here? And, and she's right. It's, it's a pain once the garden gets going, but I'm sure you kind of feel this way too. Like when I prepare all that soil space, it's like, man, I want to use every square inch of this. I don't want to have a big stupid row taking up all this space, but gosh, that's really a lesson I've learned over the years. It probably is worth leaving a little more space so you can access it. Um, just like you talked about scouting for 
insects, you know, like you're not going to scout as much if you can't get in there, you're not going to weed as much. And it's just, you know, years of doing it wrong has taught me like you probably should leave a little space. Uh, but again, you could probably walk through my garden this year and find spots where I didn't do that. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's a, it's a common mistake because you're planting these, you know, little bitty, you know, quarter inch seeds. And then the next thing you know, you have a six foot vining plant. So mm -hmm. um, it's an easy mistake to make. But do you read those backs of those seed packets? Mm -hmm. They'll give you a lot of good information. Right. I think I have one more picture. Oh, two more pictures. Um, just wanted to mention, you know, as I was last night saying I picked a five gallon bucket of cucumbers, what do you do with all them besides share them with friends and coworkers? Um, obviously, you can do a, a lot with uh, food preservation. You can make pickles with cucumbers, um, tomatoes here for most people in a week or so, or maybe even now, depending on where you live, you got more tomatoes and you know what to do with. Just wanted to make mention that as horticulture educators, um, you know, it's, we don't talk about food preservation, but we do have a team of folks um, that's put together a University of Illinois Extension uh, food website. And part of that is they have food preservation information. So just encourage everyone, if you're looking for food preservation information, um, what to do with it as far as canning and drying, fermenting, jams, jellies, pickles, um, this is a great place to start is the University of Illinois Extension's um, food preservation website. And also just mention that their University of Georgia has a website called National Center for Home Food Preservation. And um, we highly recommend both of these websites. Do be very, very cautious. The only thing I'll make mention on with food preservation is be extremely cautious of um, any recipes that you're gathering that are not from these two websites or a university-based or even like ball would be a good one, but um, be cautious of other ones. If they're not food tested, um, they're probably not something you want to use, particularly if you're canning. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of issues can, lots of things can go wrong when you're canning. So be very careful. Yeah. And there's a lots of, a lot, just like anything, any gardening information or anything, there's so many just random blogs and websites and things. Don't, don't just use the first thing that pops up in a Google search. I, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that, Jennifer. We've got quite a few questions rolling in. So let's revisit. Let me scroll here. Let's revisit squash bugs. We have a couple more questions there. Very common thing we get asked about, right? Um, Denise asks, will the squash bugs overwinter in the soil, in the containers, or just uh, plant debris? So do they overwinter in the soil too, or is it just on the plant debris that might be on top of the soil? From everything I've read, it's in the plant debris. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, dismiss though that they would enter overwinter just about everywhere. Those things are so hardy. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're they're pretty they're opportunistic. Well, do they overwinter as eggs, or what stage are they in? They overwinter as adults. Adults. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Let's see. Kathy asked at the same time, should we cover our garden in the winter to prevent this? Cover in the area, do anything? I don't think so. You could add a cover crop to your garden, but I wouldn't cover anything. I think that would actually cause more issues. Right. Yeah. You um, kind of insulate create, them a create, little more. Yeah. Create warmer soil conditions. Yeah. I think mm. so too. Okay, let's see. And then let's see. Sergio also asked, any soil treatments for over the winter to reduce that? Nothing I'm aware of. No. Yeah. yeah. Just clean up good and keep an eye out next year. <laughs> okay, let's see. We've got lots more questions. Keep them coming, guys, in the comment box. Um, Kate asked, we're trying to grow watermelons. Do you have any tips? Um, lots of space. <laughs> that's, that's probably the best tip. Um, I don't know. We've done watermelons a little bit, and I can't say that we've had just absolutely spectacular watermelons. You know, it's they take a lot of space. They really spread out, and um, I don't know. What, what else could we say? I, not not to discourage it, but I just um, – it's something that I, I kind of think twice before we go do that again just because of all the area that it takes up. For, and well, for – Two or three watermelons, or whatever yeah. we've gotten that were. What about what about trellising? Have you ever trellised watermelons? 
You could if you were doing the small, really small, like a softball size watermelon, mm -hmm. but anything bigger than that, you would have to have a support. Um, mm -hmm. I have seen where people have taken like a pantyhose yeah. and supported it and tied it up to a fence. But again, um, when you're getting into watermelons, it, they take up a lot of real estate in the garden that you're not getting as much production from that space. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, better off to go to Beardstown and pick up a watermelon, no, just, um, go to your local farmer's market. Um, but yes, they could, if you had the small ones, you know, maybe even something up to, oh, uh, like a soccer ball size. If it got that size, you could probably use pantyhose and fet trellis them that way, you know, but uh, otherwise, no, most of them are grown on the ground because they just take up, they, they mm -hmm. get so heavy. Yeah. But I think that's a good point too, Jennifer. It's like you always have to kind of weigh the, the cost benefit of what you're growing with how much space you have. Like, is it is it worth it to grow this when I could probably get it cheaper at the farmer's market or somewhere else and save space for something maybe that's going to be better growing yeah. on your own? Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at my plants right now, of my watermelon and, and and the melon plants I have, I have three watermelon on the on the plant. I don't see any melons yet. And I look at that space and say, okay, I, I could have put two to three rows of green beans in here and, you know, had bushels of green beans. So right. it just depends on the amount of space you have. You know, always fun to try different things. And, you know, back, I used to have a much larger space that I just kind of tilled up an in, in-ground garden, you know, and had all kinds of room. And that's when I, I kind of used to do them. But I'd say just a few observations. Um, I always tried to, as those melons developed, I tried to get a little straw underneath them. So they weren't sitting on the soil, you know, that tends that mm -hmm. moisture it traps and other things tends to be bad. So that's maybe a tip. Um, another thing uh, I think in my observation is just, just that, uh, that they're kind of a little bit more drought sensitive. I felt like than other vegetables around them. And you know how that is. There's like something that you see that's starting to wilt sooner. I feel, and maybe, maybe it was just my garden conditions, but I always felt like, you know, watermelon was kind of the first thing to start wilting out there. And so I was trying to get, that would be the first area that I would water when it was getting dry. Um, but those are probably the two care tips. I don't know that I really ran into many um, insects or pests or pathogens on them that I can think of. Um, it was just like I felt like um, I maybe didn't give them the space to expand enough to have like a lot of healthy fruits, you know, because I had it, they had to stay in the row or the area that I had. So maybe that's Maybe that's a recommendation. It's just that before you plant to have just a giant sprawling space, but I don't know. Nice. Yeah. Or look for small fruiting, um, smaller space plants. I mean, they, they are out there. Um, yeah. The seed's obviously yeah. going to be a little bit more expensive and you're going to have to probably mail order it, but there are what they call more like space saving, you know, that take up a smaller footprint, but they still, mm -hmm. they're still going to take up a good amount of space. Nice. Yeah, Kate says she's glad my boyfriend isn't listening to your advice because he told me not to get the, <laughs> those watermelon plants. So <laughs> keep it up, Kate. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me get caught up on our questions here. Keep them coming, guys. Um, along with similar kind of trellising lines, Kathy asks, can we stake up zucchini plants? Normally wouldn't need to. There most yeah. of your most of your zucchini type plants are what we call a bush bush type, and they're they're self supporting. Um, staking them, I don't think would have a whole lot of advantage, uh, but it just depends on what kind of plants you're growing. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Let's see. Trisha asks, um, where is the best place to send in a soil sample for a vegetable garden? Well, there's a lot of places that, you know, actually we're, we're lucky in Illinois. We've got so much agriculture. I mean, I'm, I'm in Champaign. I'll bet there's five or six soil testing labs just right here around town. Um, I think, you know, Extension used to maintain a list of those online. I've started to refer folks to the, is it like the Illinois Soil Testing Labs Association? Uh, we can maybe get a link for that, but that's probably the better list. Like I think our list is this is this is something we've started to kind of address as a team. Our list is maybe out of date and we need to update it, but there's some folks actually working on a whole kind of website for extension that talks about uh, soil testing right now. I don't think it's quite ready yet, but um, there's lots of labs around the state that you can pretty easily find. Um, 
you know, pretty much uh, you definitely want to test with, send your samples into a lab and the home test, they just aren't as consistent. They aren't as reliable. Um, you know, any lab is going to going to do that. Run that soil analysis by a, a set of lab protocols that is the same across all labs and it's consistent and should get you the same results. So definitely want to send it into a lab. Um, again, you can find them in, in your area, really anywhere in Illinois. Uh, you can walk in and hand your soil sample to them, or you can mail it in. So you don't even have to go in there if you don't want to. But the one thing I do kind of always recommend is that you talk with that lab ahead of time as to how you're going to handle your sample, how you're going to get it in, just at least be on the same page with them. Um, so, so you collect it in a way that's usable for the lab. And really, they probably all have about a similar requirement or, or method for that. But it's just always good to kind of talk about that. Mm -hmm. But it uh, should be pretty pretty easy to get that in. And then um, they'll send you results. I really like a lot of the results you get from these labs because you, you'll definitely want to specify whether it's a vegetable garden, uh, a tree or tree or shrub or like turf area that you're sending in your test results for because they'll give you sending in your test works to give you different results based on those. But usually it's pretty good recommendations of the standard ranges for all the different soil nutrients and even sometimes recommendations on what you should add or if you need to at all. So um, yeah. I don't know. So don't Ryan, Ryan, while you were talking, I went ahead and looked it up because I thought we were pretty close with it. And there oh. is a, if you were to, if anyone was to Google, do a search for University of Illinois Extension Soils, um, it will pull up our new soils web page, um, mm -hmm. which is extension.illinois.edu slash soil. And on that website, there is information on collecting soil samples, interpreting the results, soil test labs and it links you to uh, another site for commercial labs in Illinois. Um, and then it also for commercial type growers, it goes into greenhouse media and compost nutrients and heavy metals. So, so we've got it linked in the comments too. So you guys can just click right on that. Yeah, great. I, I knew people were working on that over the winter and I talked, I was on a few of the calls. So I'm, I'm glad to see that's been up, put up now. And yeah, there should be quite a bit of info on that site. Yeah, and I was going to tell folks too. I know if you head to our Illinois Extension YouTube page, I know there's two great featured videos. Probably it should be right at the top on how to take a soil sample and how to interpret the results too. So if you need a little bit more help, you can head there too. Yeah. Yeah, and another thing I always kind of remind folks of, and I I learned this lesson by just kind of asking some questions, is that any of those labs that you submit your results to, they have an agronomist on staff that can help you with that interpretation, and mm -hmm. uh, you know they all kind of view that as part of what they're selling you for the fee for your soil test is some of that info. So don't be afraid to call, and I I always kind of felt bad asking questions, but I always had questions when I got soil tests back in the past, and I've just found that those lab folks are super friendly, and they usually really know how to get you moving in the right direction and give you great recommendations. So don't be afraid to ask some questions there or, you know, all of us at Extension can help. You know, we've got master gardeners and court educators like the three of us, you know, that can can help with interpretation. So yeah. don't feel lost when you get the results. There's lots of places to go to help uh, kind of figure out the next steps. Yeah, lots of help. And we recommend doing that at least every five years. And if you have um, issues with your soil, to do that every three years. Um, but going through a lab is the best way to do that. Yeah. Okay, let me, we've got a couple other questions over here on the YouTube stream. Uh, let's see, Sergio asked earlier, has the spring summer weather caused any issues such as dwarf plants? Have you seen any weather issue, related issues in the garden this year, guys? Not really in vegetable gardens. I don't know. I'd. I'd say on trees and shrubs, it's kind of another great anthracnose year, if you want to <laughs> look at that. Uh, nice and wet spring to get it started. Yeah, it's just your, we've had a lot of wet springs lately. There's uh, just a lot of plants that show signs of anthracnose this time of year. Uh, I think more of an issue this summer was the heat, the extreme heat. Mm -hmm. Um, drought, yeah. Of what I noticed, and we in this in central Illinois, we haven't really had too much of a drought where where I'm at over where Ryan is, central Illinois, different story. Um, but moisture has been pretty decent. But what we found with that extreme heat was it wasn't cooling down at night either and cause a lot of blossom drops. So even though I had green beans that were loaded with blossoms and flower, you know, flowers. 
Um, I didn't see green beans for several weeks till those temperatures cooled down a bit because they, they're they're what they're going to do is abort those flowers um, to try to keep that plant alive. Um, is one of the things that I notice. Um, and you know, of course, right now if you're in that St. Louis metro area um, down in, in you know a little bit further south in Illinois, um, you're looking at flooding. So that's a whole nother story that they're going to have to deal with and. And probably if anyone had a garden or vegetables in those spaces, they're 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 lost for the season. So yeah. um, that's unfortunate for them. Did you, Jennifer, did you catch any of that rain? That, we did that not. We got very little of that. We were on the upper side of that. Yeah, storm. probably just and, south of you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, same thing here in central Illinois. I had some drought stress earlier on, but I think we've kind of recovered at this point. We've got enough little bits of rain. But yeah, in, in June there, like early June, I think there was just that really hot, almost 100 degree weather. That stress yeah. the plants. And I know my irrigation system was not ready for that yet. I just didn't have things in place to really irrigate like that. So yeah, I had some plant stress. But I think now that I've, I've got irrigation up and, and going a little better and we've got some rain, I feel like we're in a pretty good position weather-wise in Central Illinois mm-hmm. for this time of year. Yeah, they were calling it what a flash, a flash drought. Is that what they were calling it? Because it came on very quickly, very hot weather, and yeah, it seems like we've recovered too, and hopefully others have as well. Um, okay, let's see. I know we had a couple others over here on YouTube. Um, okay, here's an interesting one. Um, Sergio asks, what are the top five easiest foods, let's say vegetables, to grow in Illinois? So let's say you're a beginner vegetable gardener. What would be your top five easiest things to grow, you think? Hmm. You know, in in answering that question, I kind of think that there's things that are easy to grow. You know, like let's look at watermelons, for example. They seem pretty easy to grow, but you don't get a lot per acre. So I kind of, in answering that, I would kind of answer with, things that I get just a bunch of out of my garden. Uh And I mean, really, tomatoes have their problems, but they probably fall into that. Gosh, you can get just gazillions of Roma tomatoes. If you plant some of the sauce type tomatoes, you can Uh just get pounds and pounds. But um, a couple of things that maybe don't top everyone else's list that I seem to do really well with are some of the, the root crops. So like Potatoes, sweet potatoes, and garlic have been just, mm-hmm. in in my garden space, just really productive for the amount of space they took up. Um, so I don't know. That's kind of something I think a lot of folks don't think mm-hmm. about growing. But those three just have been phenomenally productive in, in a lot of years in my garden. Yeah, so... Nice. How about you, Jennifer? What do you think? I, and I would say there's, you know, your top five, it, it it could be like three different lists. So, you know, <laughs> one list is if a beginning vegetable garden, somebody who just wants to get started, has never done it before, wants to have success, what mm-hmm. would I tell them? It would be radishes, spinach, and lettuce early on in the season or as a mm-hmm. fall crop because there's very... Yeah. Spinach will get some insect pressure, but for the most part, there's very little that can go wrong there. Onions are usually super easy, Mm -hmm. um, and those are things that take up not a lot of space. But then if I'm looking at it from from Ryan's standpoint of production and probably not as much much insect issues or disease issues, I'd say green beans, cucumbers, tomatoes. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, those would be the, the ones that I would go to. Um, but then I would say squash is a high producer, but then I say not for the beginning gardener necessarily because they're going to get disappointed when those squash bugs come in and, and have yeah. to manage that. So it depends on how you're looking at it from a production standpoint, ease. But what I also tell people is what five things do you like to grow? What what do you like to eat? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Go for that. Yeah. and Exactly. Yeah. Think about what you like to eat or what do you like to preserve or, ne- or have done preserving wise. So that's kind of driven a lot of, what, but, but green beans are a great one. That, that's a great point, Jennifer. And th- they, they will like produce more than we can even eat in it. You know, I, and I, I freeze them as kind of, you know, probably the way that I preserve the most of them, but, um, but they're, they're super productive and just keep, keep uh, producing all year. So that's, that's a great one. Yeah. And, and in our household, it's not, freezing. My family doesn't like frozen green beans for some reason. So it's canning, which obviously takes a lot more time to do. (laughs) Don't ever look at how much time you spend on a quart of green beans. Uh, You'll never do it again. But anyway, um, my experience has been I get two really good pickings. The first one and the second one are really good. And after that, it kind of slows down or 
the insects get in there if you're not, you know, using any pesticides. Um, so what I'm going to do actually again tonight is I'm going to try to plant another row of green beans. So I get, mm -hmm. a, you know, some fresh eating ones later in the season. Probably won't get a whole, you know, one, maybe one or two pickings out of it before frost, but um, it'll be, it'll be worth it um, to do that. Yeah, that's the nice thing is you can you can keep planting up to late in the season because there's such a short ripening time for those. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of green beans out of a small space. Cool. OK. Yeah. And if we get caught up on questions, we'll definitely kind of talk about like, what can we be doing now to prep for prep for fall? But let's see, I've got a couple others. Uh, Mimi asks, I have so many large leaves on my zucchini. Is it OK to just cut the leaves off or am I causing trouble? Hmm. Any need to cut leaves I, off? I don't season? think I would cut them off. What I you, wouldn't. I'd yeah. leave it be. Yeah. You're just inviting trouble when you start removing leaves from, from a squash plant. And, and while we're talking about that, I'll just show one of mine from last night. This okay. is called Green Griller. Um, you pick this one. It's about four, four to five inches long. You can see it's really small, but it's nice to slice and put on the grill or just eat it the way it is. Um, but Nice. This, this is one of my plants that probably won't be here next week. So, anyway, yeah. <laughs> but I have some fruit now. Nice. Well, and you harvested at the right time, right? Because I'm sure yeah. it would have gotten bigger if you left it. <laughs> well, yeah. and I don't know if folks can see that, but um, one of the things you want to make sure with any of your summer squash is that they're a glossy color. Once that skin dulls, it means you've missed the prime picking time. So, mm -hmm. I always tell folks, not for this one because you're not going to find this in the grocery store, but look at what the size is in the grocery store and you don't want it any bigger than that. Mm, good, tip. That's good tip. But that's hard to keep up on. Let's face yeah. it. We've all oh, had yeah. the giant, giant zucchinis yeah. in the garden. Yeah. Then there's the zucchini bread and the muffins and then you're trying <laughs> to use it all. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, Sergio asked, any tips for composting or ways to offset the fertilizer shortages that we've been hearing about? Any kind of quick tips on composting for a vegetable gardener? Mm, I do a lot of composting, but I, I guess for me, I, I have a three bin system and it takes up a lot of space. So that's maybe the thing is like, really, I've, I've dealt with smaller ones. I've dealt with uh, the kind that you turn. And it's just like, I feel like you need a little space in bigger bins is the best way that I've been able to accomplish it. Um, but that's how it works in my garden. So not... But, but it's a great way to produce your own organic matter for garden soil, mm -hmm. definitely. And I guess the things I would add um, is compost is great if you have the space and the time and the and are able to do that. Um, if not, and you're going to con a traditional garden or raised beds, um, one thing that I think may have helped my garden this year is I added uh, some compost manure, rabbit manure to it. Um, I don't think that hurt at all. I, my fertility has been low for a long time and that's, you know, you don't get, your plants don't perform as well. So if you're, if you're able to start scouting now, try and find someone that would have some, some manure, make sure it's composted if you can uh, put that on in the fall is a great time to do that. Then you're, you know, ready for next year and it can also still be breaking down, um, I'm not going to say it's free everywhere, but you know, some a lot of folks that do have manures are are offering it for free if you're coming out and putting it in, in your own truck or your own bags. Um, but you can also purchase com, uh, manures as you know, composted manures. And another thing to consider that we you know don't have time to talk about today, but um, certainly could be another show is is planting a cover crop um, mm -hmm. this fall in your garden. That's a great way to get some green manure into your into your gardening for some fertility. Yeah, that, that's a great point you make, though, Jennifer. Yeah. Just that, um, you know, straight up compost you're putting into the soil, that's adding organic matter, but that's not bringing the nutrients that you can put in. You know, essentially like fertilizer that you get out of a manure and need a composted manure, too. So it's definitely something to think about in what you're what you're adding or trying to go for. Um, another thing with smaller space that I've, I've been impressed with is vermicomposting, and that's where you're actually using worms to speed up that process. And... Uh, you see a lot of folks that do it indoors in a little plastic tub kind of thing. I actually, a number of years ago, built some outdoor bins that there's some really neat designs online. I just got a design off the internet and they stack on top of each other. So the worms kind of crawl up through these, their screen bottoms. And, you know, when we did that, I could not keep those worms. I couldn't keep enough stuff in there for them you know, as fast as they were decomposing it. So it really is pretty efficient and a great way to do it. 
Um, so that's another thought for a smaller space to really efficiently compost things, uh, consider vermicomposting. Yeah, totally. Cool. Okay. Awesome question. And this is a great seg segue question. Um, is now the time to plant for the second season? So that's a, a great question. What can we be doing in the vegetable garden now to kind of prepare for a fall harvest or, yeah, want to touch on that? Well, I'd say pretty much throughout Illinois right now, it'd be a great time to get that fall crop in. Um, Northern Illinois, you might want to, might have wanted to do it last week or a little bit sooner, but certainly there are a whole host of plants that you can be planting right now. As I mentioned, I'm going to probably replant a row of green beans and some squash. Will I get very much harvested from that before the first frost? Probably not, but that's okay. I, it's just to have some fresh vegetables for a couple weeks. Um, but if you're looking at, you know, what can I plant now to harvest for, you know, a good portion of the fall, um, the list is very long. Um, you know, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli plants would all be great choices for now if you can find those plants or you have some extra seed. Um, turnips, collards, lettuce, radishes, spinach. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got carrots written down here, beets, kohlrabi, kale, Swiss chard, and even maybe some peas if you have a few pea seeds left. Or even onions, if you can, if you have some seeds, you could throw those out too. But mm -hmm. um, certainly a great time to be doing that is right now. Nice. Yeah. Basically, anything you might have planted for the early spring can you can consider for that kind of cold tolerant fall crop, right? Yeah, and some of those things Jennifer mentioned, um, spinach and kale kind of come to mind, actually get better if they're exposed to mm -hmm. lower temperatures. The plant concentrates sugars into the leaves and it improves the quality. And gosh, kale is one of those that I've been shocked to see how long it'll keep going. You know, just keep plugging away till. You know, we used to live in Southern Illinois, which is a little warmer and yeah, into like, you know, December, January, we'd still have a live kale plant I could go get some leaves off of. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's actually another one that's really productive. If you can um, get a good patch going, um, you can get all the kale you'd ever want to eat out of a, a small size kale patch. So most definitely, you know, and if folks want to even extend that a little bit further, as you're mentioning, Ryan, um, I've had a few volunteers that have, if you straw your spinach and your kale late in the season before, you know, mm -hmm. that ground gets frozen, but get that mulch really well with some straw, you know, a couple, several inches, um, and go out and scrape that off in February, March. Sometimes those plants actually survive and then they'll keep producing into the, into the spring. Nice. So, something yeah, that's pretty do. neat. Really that's getting it. the most out of that one seed that you planted. <laughs> <laughs> You're really getting your bang out of your buck on that one, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Kathy asks, how can we have a constant cilantro supply? Reseed, reseed, reseed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always be planting. Every, yes. every seven to ten days. Yeah, succession planting. That's like one of the perfect plants for it. Or, um, you know, like I did a, a big patch of cilantro and not... Not a whole lot of cilantro fans in my family. I guess, you know, my wife and I both like it, but my kids aren't huge fans. And uh, we didn't quite use all of it. And some of it went to seed. And now I've got little cilantro weeds all over the place, which <laughs> it's kind of cool. You got like now I don't I didn't even have to plant a patch this year. I can go earlier in the season, just weed and get enough cilantro for a small recipe by pulling some weeds. So, um, but yeah, it's a great one. It's really productive in the garden. If, if you like cilantro and want to use a lot. You can get a ton out of a small space of, with cilantro. But it is the one of the herbs that if you plant it, when it decides it wants to bolt, it's done. There's nothing you're going to do to try to get it to trick it to keep going. It it is finished when it when it goes to yeah. seed. Plant some more seeds. Yeah. Awesome. Let's see. Sergio asks, um, can we see your vermiculture bins at some point in the future? Yeah, we'll definitely jot that down as a as a topic yeah. idea for sure. Um, let's see, Mimi asked, is it better to thin out leaves and stems in, um, oh, she's talking about tomato plants. Is it better to thin out leaves and stems in Northern Illinois, or should you not because of the short season? Well, we, you know, we talked about that a little bit off air before the show, uh, um, just really kind of dealing with the, all those foliar problems on tomatoes and, um, I mean, the way Jennifer and I both kind of handle that is just any any leaf that starts to show any sign of a symptom lower on the plant, just get it out of there. I mean, get it out. Don't put it in your compost bin. You've got to get it out, destroy it. You don't want any of those spores flying around. 
to reinfect anything. So um, also, I mean, there's a lot of benefit to pruning tomato plants so they don't have all this extra foliage that traps moisture in that canopy and just maximizes the growth. So I'm a big fan of like lots of tomato pruning. So I don't know anything to add, Jennifer, as far as as far as the short growing season, I don't think that would worry me. What do you no, yeah, that wouldn't that wouldn't worry me. Um, but the main thing is just tomatoes. Although you think you can just plant it, walk away, and then go pick the fruit, um, there are several steps that you should take in between that, and that is, you know, being diligent about removing some of those lower leaves, so they're not so close to the ground. Making sure you mulch that plant really well mm, um, with yeah. straw or any kind of organic type matter that so you don't have the soil splashing onto the plant. Um, if you're growing in a container, though. I would just mention the difference there would be to use fresh soil, fresh soilless mix every single year. Don't reuse that soilless mix um, from year to year with tomato plants in particular. Um, but yeah, pruning, I tried, I started this season off with, you know, trying to keep mine pruned for a couple of weeks and then not so much, but I think the pruning did help a little bit. Nice. nice. Yeah. And I, I was the backwards of that. I was, I was late to get to the pruning and I'm paying for it now. I've got some, <laughs> we got some disease looking leaves. Thankfully, you know, your plants kind of keep growing out of that as they explode out of the top of the cages or whatever you got. And I think I'm st still getting good tomatoes. So I think I'll be able to outpace the, the fungus with tomato production on the top of the plant, but uh, can't say enough for pruning early and, and often on tomatoes. Nice. Well, let's continue that conversation because Juan has a, a question there. And thank you all for the questions. Keep them coming. We've got about 10 minutes to go. So if you've got other things you want to hear about, keep adding them in. Um, Juan asks, can we talk about common tomato plant issues, dark spots on the leaves, et cetera, and how to remedy tomato plant issues? He said it's very confusing with all the different recommendations. Some say use chemicals, others say don't. So maybe just talk generally about kind of common plant issues and some of those preventative things you may want to do? Sure. Well, kind of what I covered, what we talked about already is just yeah. kind of a lot of the, there's soil-borne pathogens, a number of them, that splash up onto the tomato leaves. So, you know, the ways we've talked about limiting that are with straw mulch, like the second you plant those tomato plants, get it doesn't have to be straw mulch, but getting them mulched really well. I've used a variety of different mulches. And then as any of those leaves start to show a sign of infection, getting them pruned off because that's just going to help that fungus climb up the plant mm -hmm. if you leave those infected leaves on. Uh, the other thing I'll add that maybe we didn't talk about, and these are just all kind of, you know, the, the cultural ways we can control this, um, is to use like drip irrigation or some way that I use soaker hose on my tomatoes, where in other parts of my garden, I have overhead watering that I do that's just easier for other areas. But not ever having that, you know, water coming down and splashing up is another way to kind of limit that. But those are the main pathogens I deal with. But what are some others we could talk about? So um, I, I don't think we've seen it yet on tomatoes, but blossom end rot was a big mm -hmm. problem with a lot of the fruits um, when we were in the going through that drier, hot, hot couple weeks. Um, yeah. so we may see some of that. And um, that really is just keeping consistent moisture to the plant and instead of, you know, allowing it to, to dry out and over water and that kind of thing. So consistent moisture is key. Um, but one of the things my go-tos, anytime somebody says I have a problem with my tomatoes, my instant response is, Sorry, wrong, wrong state, but Iowa State University, tomato diseases and disorders. They have a PDF mm -hmm. of about 14 pages of all the tomato diseases and disorders, which we see here in Illinois as well. And that is what my go-to to refer everyone to just because some of those diseases all look, they look similar. Um, but many times what we're finding is it's just the cultural practices that you do early on are very, very important to how that plant does later on. So mm -hmm. as Ryan mentioned, the mulching, making sure that the plants you're buying are disease-free, make sure you inspect those before you plant them. Um, that's where it all starts in our gardens and you know, making sure we've got a good quality potting soil mix and we're potting them up. So that that's kind of where it starts, mm -hmm. I think. Is mm -hmm. Yeah, really, and really some of those things you mentioned are, are what got me into starting seeds in the first place. And, you know, this is the first year I really didn't start a lot of stuff. But, um, 
getting resistant varieties sometimes is difficult it, unless you go purchase special seed that you almost have to order on the internet. Um, sometimes you can find it in garden centers, but a lot of garden centers just have like really run of the mill varieties that I feel like a lot of times don't have great disease resistance. So um, trying to find the disease resistant varieties is a reason to start seeds. And then, yeah, having those disease free plants that go in, because you'll see a lot of times at garden centers, they're already starting to have those lower dead dead leaves so you bring that to your garden and and you're just you know you're you're already behind on the pruning and, and management of that so for those two reasons that's a, a great case for trying to start some seeds at home and that's probably a whole other show like seeds started <laughs> at home and actually candace i think we've done a show or two we have yeah years on that um, and we'll show we'll do it again i'm sure <laughs> yeah yeah Nice. And we've got that Iowa State fact sheet linked in the comments. So definitely check that out. That is a really great one with photos. Um, I don't think the one thing I don't think we mentioned yet is rotation, too. Mm. You guys want to yeah. kind of mention how that might help with some of those soil borne diseases, too? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, and that's that's part of my vegetable garden is the rotation of moving things, moving things around. So uh, there's just really great information. I, I wish I wish I had like a an Iowa State kind of link right <laughs> offhand to, to give to you, but uh, basically you there you know we can kind of lump vegetables into about four different groups that you need to rotate between, and so you know I guess one help help me name off the groups, Jennifer. You know one would be like kind of your tomatoes, peppers, all that. Solid ATA. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, root crops would be another group. Mm -hmm. um, brassicas. 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 So brassicas, I mean, that's, you know, kale, kohlrabi, um, broccoli, just all that stuff that, you know, interestingly, all are like the same species, but just different variations, which is so cool. And then what's our last group, like leafy vegetables? Leafy stuff, yeah. And so what you want to do is just make sure you're switching groups. So for the next the next thing you plan in that space next year, you just need a, a different group to come in. And, um, you know, I used to have a garden that was just a big garden. Where, where now I've kind of separated with permanent paths, you know, spaces that are, I consider, you know, more or less beds. And so then in my garden space, each bed is a different group then, where when mine was just a whole like, you know, tilled up space that's a garden, you know, just open space that's a garden, it was kind of hard to get that crop rotation because like, where do you start and stop what what was here last year? And without a picture, I wouldn't know exactly. So um I know it sounds silly, but taking pictures of your garden that you can look at next year or what I do most years is, and this is just so my wife and I can kind of plan where we're planning stuff. I love to draw a little picture, you know, of my whole garden. And in some years I'm better at recording what what's good and bad and what's not. But, you know, in, in the perfect year, I would have recorded, you know, what was planted where on my little map in like a good or bad rating for that variety, you know, whatever the variety was. And so then next year, I can just look at that little map and say, oh, okay, tomatoes were there this year. You know, I'll put the brassicas there next year, you know, this, you know, this year. So um, some record keeping, because it's, you know, as, as much as you think you just would remember where every plant was, I've, yeah. I've found myself scratching my head before, like, where were the tomatoes last year? It all tends to blur together. So yeah. I try to take pictures too, because I try to do the yeah. same thing with my cut flower raised beds and figure out, okay, where did I have it last year? What's probably going to reseed and come up in that same spot last year. But it's the same thing. I have a bed of uh, lisianthus that I'm growing for a cut flower and I'm definitely going to rotate something else that's not closely related into that bed next year because slowly there's just some root pathogen that's spreading throughout the entire bed. So I'm like, okay, next year something else has got to go in that spot. So it definitely applies. So, yeah, yeah so it really, really helps with pathogens, really helps with um, different plants take up different nutrients in different levels. And so when you rotate like that, it's, you know, helping your plants stay more disease free. It's helping better manage the nutrients in your soil because you're switching it up and you don't have one plant that's depleting all of everything every year. So um, yeah. there's probably even other benefits. I don't know. Think of any other benefits of crop rotation. Um, Just a good thing to do if you've got a, if you've got yeah. a big space, but you know, sometimes you don't have that amount of space. So you do the best you can. Um, and if that's, you know, if you're not able to rotate, it's looking for things with disease resistance um, is the best, best way to go. Yeah. And the nice thing about growing in containers, too, if you're more of a container vegetable garden, is you can swap out entirely new potting mix every season, disinfect the container, clean everything up good, and prevent a lot of that, too. 
Yeah. yeah, actually, con container gardening, as hard as it is to keep things watered, it solves a lot of other problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can do it in any tiny space. So it's, I always try and do a few things in containers just to, just to do it every year. I mean, and, and have it like right at my back door. It's, it's kind of nice, as opposed to across the yard in the garden. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, thank you guys for all your questions. I think we'll finish off with one tree question because we, we've, we've been focused on vegetables today which is awesome um so this is right up ryan's alley probably so debbie asks is it useful to let a cut down black oak tree that has new shoots growing from the she said grade level like ground level trunk continue to grow will it become a tree again she said i cut down a five-year-old black oak tree to the ground because all the leaves were infected with a blackish fungus um, well, you know, that's a common practice in forestry is we, we, as foresters, we call that coppicing where you cut a tree to the ground and let it grow back with something new, with a new plant. Um, and so, yeah, that, that'll grow into a perfectly healthy tree. I, I guess the thing that, um, is maybe a negative side of it is you may have some rot there from the old trunk that's, that, you know, it's growing out of. So you need to just kind of maybe watch how much rot's developing in that old little section of trunk. But yeah, over time, that'll grow into a brand new tree. Oaks are known to be great at coppicing. Um, and that's, so that's a common practice we do for, for oak trees. Sometimes as a forester, um, that's recommended to do across a stand of oak trees to thin things out, get a little more light in there or correct the form of a tree that started to grow and have some type of defect. So yeah, that's, that is a way to start a new plant. And I think I already said this, but there's certain species that are good and certain species that are bad at that. So it's not, you know, don't assume that for every species, but oaks, yes, they definitely fall into that category of, of great coppice plants. So. Okay, very good. Awesome. Well, and the only thing I'd add to that is um, before you do that, just make sure that you, the location of that tree is really where you wanted it to be mm -hmm. uh, to begin right. with, because sometimes as, as gardeners, just like in our vegetable gardens, we tend to overcrowd things. So just make sure that, you know, it's got 40, 50 feet of tree canopy that it can develop there and not grow into a power line or not hit your house and that kind of thing. So just make sure your site location is what you want before you, before you go that route. Yeah. Good yeah, tip. Good point. Good tip. Very point. And let's see, let's do one more quick tree one. Um, Kathy asked earlier too, how, um, basically she's asking how to get rid of a tree, a woody weed that with roots that have deep and a kind of a large network of roots. So maybe talk about kind of a cut treatment quick and how you want something that's going to go in systemically into the root system. Yeah, Candace is exactly right. You'd want to do a cut stump treatment is usually the most effective way to kill a woody plant. And that's uh, you're just cutting off the stump and putting an appropriate herbicide on that uh, cut surface. Uh, just a few basic tips. You really want to do that quickly after cutting it. There's research that shows, you know, within a matter of minutes, your effectiveness of that herbicide goes down because the tree starts to react to that cut surface. So cut it, uh, get it treated right away. Um, and then that pesticide gets taken up and, and gets down to the roots and it kills the roots is your goal. So uh thing to be careful of with a patch of stuff is that you don't, if you have a lot of stems you're cutting all over the place, you can actually get a little too much herbicide out there or that can be an issue. So, um, so just be careful with, I, I've had issues with lots of little tiny stems and cutting those and trying to have an appropriate amount of herbicide that's not going above the labeled rate because mm -hmm. there's a, a rate for pounds per acre of herbicide you can apply in a year. Uh, and so beyond that, um, that's probably about all we have time to get to talk about. But um, yeah, yeah, most effective would be cut stump treatment. Very good. Kevin, you can reach out if you need some additional information or call your local extension office. The Master Gardeners uh, can probably give you some great info too. So, man, well, thank you everybody for hopping on with us today. Really great questions. Loved it. A lot of good vegetable garden talk. And Jennifer, thanks again for joining yeah. us. Great to have you. Um, everybody mark your calendars. Our next show will be August 18th, it's about a month or so. And I believe our topic is going to be rain gardens and permeable hardscapes. So we've got a couple of great guests who are going to be joining us to talk about that. So thank you everybody for joining us. If there's ever topics that you want to hear about from us, definitely let us know. Shoot us a Facebook message. We're going to be doing a planning meeting right after this, actually. So we would love to talk about what you guys want to want to hear about. So 
Thanks, everybody. We will see you next month and have a great rest of the day.